Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're covering sickle cell anemia. Now, this is one of those conditions where knowing the patho really helps us understand the why behind every single thing we do. So let's jump right into our practice question. Remember to tuck this away for later because we will come back to the correct answer at the end of the episode. A nurse is caring for a hospitalized adolescent with sickle cell anemia who is in vaso-occlusive crisis. Which of the following findings requires immediate intervention? Is it A, a report of leg and joint pain 9 out of 10? B, requesting additional pain meds before they're due? C, a sudden onset of shortness of breath and chest pain? Or D, mild scleral icterus and pale mucous membranes? So let's dive in. What is sickle cell anemia? It's a genetic blood disorder where the red blood cells, you guys know, normally RBCs, soft, round, flexible, Instead, they take on a rigid crescent or sickling shape. Now, these misshapen cells are stiff and sticky. Instead of flowing smoothly through blood vessels, they start clumping together and clogging up small capillaries, which can lead to vaso-occlusion. So vaso is our vessel, our blood vessel, and obviously occlusion, they are blocked. This is a blockage of blood flow. Anytime blood isn't flowing, that means the tissues downstream from that flow, they don't get any oxygen. So that starts causing a lot of trouble. Now let's go back to the basics for a sec. Why do we even have these sickling of cells? Well, remember, hemoglobin is the protein inside of red blood cells. That's what actually carries the oxygen. In sickle cell anemia, we said this was a genetic disorder, right? that hemoglobin is abnormal. Instead of having hemoglobin A, our normal adult hemoglobin, they have hemoglobin S. And under stress, this hemoglobin S can change shape to that crescent sickle shape, get rigid and get stuck. So stress, I'm talking things that increase our body's oxygen demand. I'm talking infection, dehydration, cold weather, high altitude, Anytime our body needs more oxygen, it's like, hey, hemoglobin, let's go here. Let's get inside these red blood cells and bring some oxygen to the tissue. It's too much. They sickle, vaso-occlusion, they get stuck. So the body, it ends up with fewer functioning red blood cells, chronic anemia, sickle cell anemia. That vaso-occlusion, that obstruction, severe pain and organ damage because we ain't getting oxygen out to the tissues. The red blood cells also just don't live as long as they should. Normal adult, about 120 days. Sickled ones, 10 to 20 days. The body is just constantly trying to keep up. And any time the body needs more oxygen than it can keep up with, there is risk for a vaso-occlusive crisis. So this happens when sickled cells start clogging up all those tiny vessels, and blocking our oxygen delivery. We can't get oxygen to bones, our joints. That hurts really bad, super bad pain. We can't get oxygen to our organs, like our spleen starts to die. We have don't have oxygen going to our lungs. We start having trouble breathing. It is this like deep, throbbing, stabbing pain, often described in the back, chest, abdomen, their bones. It is horrendous you know, 50 out of 10, the worst pain imaginable. And it can last days at a time. To make matters worse, there's not like a perfect lab or imaging test that can be like, yep, this is what's going on. And these clients require such high doses of pain medication to treat this sickle cell pain that they are often undertreated or misunderstood to be seeking drugs. That is a huge issue when we're looking at clients in a vaso-occlusive crisis. I saw this firsthand many times in the emergency department. What comes to mind immediately, though this is just one of many, is a 16-year-old African-American girl 
left school early, rode the bus to get to the emergency department because she knew she was having a vaso-occlusive crisis. Now, remember, genetic disorder, she has been diagnosed with sickle cell disease for years. She knows what this feels like. She knows what's going on. So she takes the initiative to get herself to the ED as soon as she can. She gets there and she is just writhing in pain. And to my dismay, the paramedics are not being incredibly helpful. They say that they already gave her some morphine, that it didn't really seem to touch her. She's specifically asking for Dilaudid. She says, that's what works for me. And they're like, no, you don't get to request that. They're honestly kind of brushing it off because they think that that morphine should have helped. By the time I get into the room, she is curled up in bed, clutching her knees, moaning. I ask her her pain. She's like, 9 out of 10. I'm like, girl, you look like this is a 50 out of 10. She can't eat. She can't sleep. She clearly is just so miserable. Quick review of her chart. I see she was here two months ago for the same thing. I can see exactly what we did. Pain medication, dosages, etc. So immediately I'm jumping into action here. My top three priorities are to manage her pain, get her hydrated, and get her oxygenated. Okay? She was already given a little bit of morphine. It was definitely not enough. It was not cutting it. She had a higher tolerance to opioids because she has consistently required them to manage this pain. So we actually put her on a patient-controlled analgesia pump where they have that button that they can press for pain and getting a baseline amount as well as those additional boluses. So that was my first priority to get set up. Usually, I tell you guys that pain is not a priority. Nobody dies from pain. In the case of sickle cell crisis, the pain is further worsening our problem here, okay? The further pain that they're in, the lower oxygen delivery we have. It's using up all the body's oxygen to be in so much pain. So I've got to get that under control. That's what we use a PCA for. Second, let's hydrate her. Fluids, fluids, fluids. If I'm looking at this from an ABC framework, airway, breathing, circulation, we have a C for circulation problem. These cells are sickled and not getting out to where they need to be. Oxygen's not getting delivered to the tissues. That's causing the pain. If I can hydrate and dilute out some of those sticky, sickled hemoglobins, Well, then I can deliver more oxygen to the tissues, which brings me to number three, giving oxygen. I really want to improve that oxygenation in any way that I can. So immediately we went ahead and put her on a nasal cannula. We ended up having to crank that up and have a face mask. Now, that was largely because even after starting her PCA, getting her fluids going, you know, I'm charting all the things, I go back come back to the room and she is clutching her chest. Her oxygen saturation is in the 80s. Even though we are controlling her pain and she's more comfortable, she is still struggling to breathe. And she did not want to tell me that because she had required intubation for what we call acute chest syndrome before. And she did not want to be intubated. She was very scared of that happening. So she did not tell me that she was having trouble catching her breath. But she was going into what we call acute chest syndrome. This is the scariest complication of sickle cell anemia. It happens when those sickled blood cells start blocking flow to the lungs. Chest pain, shortness of breath, fever, their oxygen is desaturating because they're not oxygenating the lungs itself. Um, It develops fast and it can be fatal. So in this case, her oxygen plummeted. We were down into the 60s on a non-rebreather. We kept having to escalate that respiratory support. And eventually her parents got to the hospital. You know, things started to move really quickly. And they did agree that, yeah, we need to go ahead and intubate her to get her oxygen level up to a point where we can actually, you know, treat this hypoxic episode give those lungs the chance to recover, and then we anticipated being able to extubate within a matter of days to weeks. For her, it ended up being five days that she needed to be intubated. That let her lungs heal. 
that let us address the vasoocclusive crisis and get more oxygen out to the rest of her body. And once those lungs had had that oxygen and healed up, we could extubate and uh, de-escalate her care from there. Now, luckily in this case, she did not have a stroke. But that is the second really scary acute complication of sickle cell. Kids with sickle cell anemia, much higher risk for stroke because of the impaired blood flow, right? If they're getting all these sickled hemoglobins, they're not getting out to the organs. If I don't get that oxygen to the brain, I can have a stroke, okay? So that is just something to put on your radar. You really want to watch out for like altered mental status, confusion, a change in level of consciousness. Any of that happens, you should be thinking stroke and acting accordingly. Okay, so let's kind of review the main things we did in this case. 16-year-old girl in the ED, acute vaso-occlusive crisis going into acute chest. Number one, we managed that pain. We got her a PCA. We were very aware that she had a higher tolerance and needed strong opioids. We had to manage that pain so her body would stop using so much oxygen because it was in pain. Two, we had to hydrate her, okay? Lots and lots of fluids. Decrease that blood viscosity and reduce further sickling. Then we had to get some oxygen. We really want to increase oxygen delivery to the tissues. Rest, rest, rest. Those were the three big things we did. We got that PCA going for pain. We hydrated with fluids. We got her oxygen. Her oxygen needs escalated to the point of intubation due to the acute chest. We watched very closely and decided when it was time to take that action. She then had to be transferred to the ICU. Like I said, it was a five-day course of intubation. She got extubated. And I want to mention one other thing. Didn't happen under my care. I was in the ED. But before she got discharged from the ICU, I went up to visit, say hi, you know, before she went home. And the long-term intervention that was prescribed was hydroxyurea. I'm honestly kind of surprised she wasn't already on it. Hydroxyurea is a med that can reduce how frequently we have these sickle cell crisis or these vaso-occlusive crisis episodes. So what it does is it increases how much fetal hemoglobin is produced versus that hemoglobin A, that normal adult hemoglobin. And fetal hemoglobin doesn't sickle like hemoglobin A does. So it will have better hemoglobin, better oxygenation for the long term, reduce those episodes of a vaso-occlusive crisis. So because this was her second crisis in, I think, two months, that hydroxyurea was prescribed long term. And then the last thing that I'd be remiss not to mention is advocating for these clients. I mentioned at the beginning I was not thrilled with how the paramedics were treating this client. And that is not to say that's how it always goes. I am sure they were great people, but there is this stigma around, hey, they could be drug seeking because the morphine's not touching them. They're like asking for drugs like Dilaudid by name. They need a really high dose. And that can lead to some bias, conscious or unconscious and anytime we have that bias, it delays treatment and it worsens outcome. So be really aware of that, reading through that medical history, applying this patho knowledge, because once you think about it, you're like, oh, they're literally having their blood cells sickled so that they're not getting oxygen to their tissues. That is massively painful. That informs everything that we do. This is not drug-seeking behavior, and we need to act accordingly. That can be easier said than done, and I like to do a lot of education, especially with my teenagers, being discharged about this because they need to be able to advocate for themselves, too. So all that aside, let's wrap it up with our original question. Hopefully now you can come up with the right answer and understand why. So a nurse is caring for a hospitalized adolescent client with sickle cell anemia. They are in a vaso-occlusive crisis. Which of the following requires immediate intervention? Is it that A, report of leg and joint pain rated 9 out of 10, B, requesting additional pain meds before they are due, C, that sudden onset of shortness of breath and chest pain, or D, the mild scleral icterus with pale mucous membranes? Okay, think it through. Say your answer out loud with me. 
It is C, that sudden shortness of breath and chest pain. That is what happened in our client. She did not want to tell me she had chest pain. I walk in though, she's clutching her chest. Her sats are in the 80s. This is acute chest syndrome. Happens fast, can become life-threatening. So this is immediate provider notification, okay? They probably are going to need intubation. What about A, that joint and leg pain, 9 out of 10? That's horrible, right? Honestly, I expect that in vaso-occlusive crisis. We have to address it promptly. We have to manage their pain. But of this list, I've got something a lot more concerning. I have a breathing ABC priority. I'm going to address that shortness of breath. B, requesting additional pain meds before it's due. Again, really common. Clients that have this sickle cell, especially those with frequent crises, they develop a high opioid tolerance. They need aggressive pain control. And D, that mild scleral icterus, pale mucous membranes, the mild should give it away there that it's not our priority, right? Both of those signs of chronic anemia. This is somewhat expected in sickle cell disease, albeit I'll say that means it's not well managed and, and does prompt intervention. But those are not A, B, or C priorities, right? Those are things that we can address later after the shortness of breath and the chest pain. And that's really your key takeaway here is that this is more than just a blood disorder, chronic condition that needs proactive, compassionate care. The priority is addressing their pain. We're then going to hydrate. We're going to oxygenate. We're going to do everything we do to get oxygen out to the tissues while we monitor for those really scary complications of acute chest and stroke. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.